Hello and welcome to the future of mobility where we look at new trends in the automotive industry. And today we are going to be talking on the future shape of cars and we have a very special guest. We have Martin Ullerick, the global head of design of Tata Motors who has shaped the company's products in recent years. And right now we have the new Punch EV which has just been launched. Uh, Martin, congratulations Thank on you. a successful launch. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, uh, looking straight away to the future shape of cars, EVs obviously taking center stage. Uh, uh, Punch on an existing ICE platform, but really differentiation, the key to make it look more EV-like. Yes. How difficult is it as a designer and, you know, what are the kind of key elements you look at in kind of electrifying the design, so to speak? Yeah, so to electrify any product or the punch in this case, uh, we looked at the punch as a product, uh, one of our most successful models. Uh, so we looked at what's making that recipe successful. I think the fact that it's a, you know, straightforward SUV, we wanted to maintain that. It looks safe, it looks uh, reliable, it looks tough. But at the same time, when you electrify it, the first thing is you need less cooling. So we reduced all of the unnecessary cooling. There's nothing superficial, right. only the minimum required. At the same time, we had the charging port and the fact that we wanted to make the car look more efficient, aerodynamic, but at the same time, still marry that with the SUV-ness. So it has a couple of things that are now established as our EV you know, DNA which is the horizontal light guide. Yeah. That's so I think the horizontal light guide is a very common trend now in, in yeah. electric vehicles. Is that like a signature? For it is, it is. And you've seen with the Nexon and now with the yeah. Punch uh, that we're really making this, you know, part of the signature, the down the road graphic. Then of course, it's just the overall architecture, the volumes, you know, make the car look wider, make the car look more stable. So all of the lights being moved outboard, you know, right. with the arrow, arrow features. Uh, and then of course, it's just making the car look as sculptural as possible. So when you're missing that sort of upper grill, it could look a little bit odd that yeah. it's missing something in the face. But of course, we've compensated that with the, the volumes and so and forth. Do you think the grill will finally disappear in, in time to come? Or is it something which uh, yeah. people relate to that, you know, it's uh, people like uh, a grill or a fog grill or a fake grill or whatever? Yeah, do you yeah. think Do you think that's still very much what consumers want? It needs want? to have some sort of face. But whether it's a grill per se, you know, that it's open or it's a pattern, uh, it still creates some sort of identity. It's still the, the visage of, of, of a product. So uh, you will have a grill, but maybe it's not a grill as we know it. You know, you've seen with, for instance, on the Avinia, it's a right. light pattern. Right. You know, so it is some sort of decor. It is some sort of, you know, feature that gives it a face. Right. And, you know, just before we jump in and drive off, uh, you know, you talked about efficiency. Yes. Aerodynamics key for an EV. Is yes. that really a focus area for you? Because honestly, with SUVs, you don't get error, you don't get a very efficient shape which affects range, but uh, you get the road, the presence. So is that now this trade-off between making something sleek, uh, you know, hunkered down, but maybe compromising the road presence a bit just to get that efficiency? No, you still have to have the road present, that sort of command driving position, that sort of stature. But, uh, but even, you know, an SUV is measured aerodynamically. So we take the car into the wind tunnel. And, you know, even these small sort of improvements do increase your overall range and your, your you know, competence and efficiency. Right. Martin, I'm going to take you for a drive. Let's okay. talk more about the interiors then. All right, let's do it. So, Martin, looking forward to this short drive and uh, chatting with you. You know, first thing I noticed... Uh, being an EV, uh, the floor goes up to accommodate the battery. So it's a higher floor. Yes. Um, is that a challenge? Because, uh, you know, you have to get the right kind of age point uh, so that you you don't have that knees up position. Yes. Yet have ground clearance. Uh, so are these uh, kind of some challenges which uh, you typically face? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the packaging of the battery and the, the Z stack, as we call it, you've got, you know, if you have an SUV, minimum ground clearance battery thickness, and then you have the age point. So all of that just adds up, that dictates where you're... And your that's a big is. conflict, isn't it? You've got to balance it all out. It is, but in the end, like we raised the floor here, we had to accommodate the battery with this uh, architecture. But I actually feel that, you know, we're sitting a little bit higher. I think the visibility is much better. But uh, headroom is something you have to then worry about. Yes, of course. You know, you have to accommodate like a minimum in terms of headroom. Interest. And with a sunroof, uh, the, uh, the, car the headliner comes right. up even more. Yeah, yeah. So... 
Look, it's always a, a bunch of stresses, you know, one one hard point going one way, another one going the other way. Right. But in the end, you just have to, you know, balance it. We always make ergonomic models with all of our products. Right. All of these changes are validated physically. Right. And, you know, Martin, I want to talk about materials. Mm. Uh, the future kind of trend towards materials in terms of design, obviously. Uh, you know, plastics are still there, but are you going to be moving to more sustainable stuff? Uh, yeah. Is there a cost element to that? What do you think is the future of that in terms of lists of material choice now? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, everything is going through the, you know, um, the lens of sustainability now as we think forward, whether it's uh, metal, plastics, the recyclability, but also the touch points. You know, you want to communicate that it's sustainable, but some of them are just, you know, naturally going to be recycled, but the customer doesn't really have to see that. Um, and it's a new technology, so it always is expensive when it's a new technology. So we have to introduce it I guess in a in a sort of natural way to the customer, you know, most of our products are competitive price wise. Right. So how do you introduce new technology and sustainability to a product that might be, you know, um, already very challenging uh, cost wise? So I think it it goes without saying that you're going to start with the top products. You know, those are the ones that are easy easier to, you know, adapt sustainable materials, and then you see a trickle down as it becomes more mainstream. Right. You could also introduce it in a special edition, right? You know, uh, and potentially, you know, uh, make the uh, the people who are buying a special edition almost investors, shareholders, right? In a, in a sustainability roadmap, right? You know, and those are usually early adopters anyway, right? And you know, uh, I just want to talk on, uh, let's say, uh, you know, the outer body. Mm -hmm. uh, steel, of course, is still everyone's favorite. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we're doing the series with JSW and uh, JSW are looking at a lot more advanced steel. They are yeah. kind of doing a fight back in terms of their technology and, yes. and quality to kind of take on any other material. So steel still very much, uh, I think, uh, the preferred material, isn't it? Yes. I mean, uh, first of all, it offers a lot of solutions for us, uh, whether it's from a design point of view in terms of formability. But then you also have to look, as just we, we were talking about sustainability, is uh, the resourcing, the sourcing of this material in terms of, you know, where it's coming from, the logistics aspect, and, uh, you know, how you can use it. And then, of course, is it ultimately, you know, a recyclable material? Right. If it is, then it takes every box. And, uh, you know, there's other materials, other, you know, metals that you can be using, you know. Uh, but I think at the moment, I would say steel still answers most of our questions. Right. And tell me from a design point of view in terms of the forming of the steel, in terms of the kind of curvatures you can have, the tight radius. Um, aluminium a challenge because it tends to tear, you know, the draw is a bit difficult. Is that also one benefit you see out of steam? Yes, there is. But there's also the, uh, you know, there's a lot of new uh, techniques in terms of how are we manufacturing uh, an exterior body shell. You know, whether it's with laser welding and whether it's how we're stamping it, you can get a lot more fidelity and a lot more sharpness nowadays than you did years ago. So you see, at least in, at least in the mass market, steel has still got a long, long way ahead there. Right? I think so, yes, definitely. Right. And, you know, just looking at overall the shape of cars, uh, uh, Martin, uh, what are the trends you're seeing? Because... Uh, you know, it, it, it's sometimes it, it, it's going back to what uh, we had. Uh, people are wanting more maybe upright vehicles for SUVs. Yes. Uh, maybe larger, as we call the DLO That's right. or the, the glass area. Yeah. Uh, do you think we're going to see that coming back? Uh, yes. I, I'm a big believer in form follows function. And if I'm looking at it from a user point of view, look at us sitting in this vehicle. I want the maximum amount of visibility, maximum amount of, of glass. Um, and... Uh, I don't know, just this feeling of lightness. You don't want to feel claustrophobic in the, in the vehicle. So I think that's definitely a trend that you'll see on the comeback. Um, and uh, the other thing is, yes, people want more upright vehicles, but it's important that we just don't create commodity vehicles that are, you know, very well executed, but a little bit characterless. Right. I think we have to offer people something that is emotional and exciting. And, you know, even for the people who just want A to B, right. the reality is it shouldn't just become... Um, you know, white goods. Yeah. Martin, looking at interior trends, uh, you know, big screens, uh, flavor of the month. I mean, even over here, you've got uh, two screens on what I would say is a, you know, sub 12 like vehicle. Yes. Even now, sub 10 like vehicle is all about screen screens and all. Do you see this trend continuing? Do you think we'd move to heads up displays finally? voice activation. Yes. Uh, what is your sense? Because honestly, from a driver distraction point of view, screen isn't ideal. 
No, I mean, we do see this screen arms race, if you want to call it that, you know, right. where it's just like, you know, how many more screens can we get? But at the same time, we see another trend, which is, you know, almost like you said, a minimization of that, uh, you know, more uh, heads up display technology, more voice activated technology and a more discreet, you know, the technology becomes much more hidden tech. And I see that more in the premium segment uh, emerging. And then the sort of mainstream segment still has this sort of, you know, screen centric uh, thing. So it's almost like a two track system. Eventually, I'll, I'll, I can see everything becoming much more integrated, that it doesn't look like an afterthought. Right. So, Martin, you know, uh, looking at, uh, again, uh, trends in, in uh, the interior, for example, uh, we spoke about the materials. Uh, what about space? Because clearly with um, a pure electric architecture, you've got a lot of flexibility over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, definitely one of the things we're trying to do is just uh, reduce reduce volume, reduce uh, complexity, uh, the, the, the white noise of uh, interior. If you look at interior design, lots of things happening visually and everything. But the main thing is all about, you know, the, the proportions of the instrument panel and the floor and the visibility. So as we were saying, you know, larger DLO, more natural light, making things all simpler, you know, using an EV should be about being effortless and easy. But right. easy to use, and that should be communicated through, you know, even the interior design. And do you think, uh, uh, you know, let's say you'll find that the dashboard is going to be pushed more outwards because, you know, all the air conditioning, the HVAC can go into into, into the, the front. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I started my career as an interior designer, and uh, the first thing you would design was the IP. Then you did the console and the doors, and then you did everything else. Now I think actually the IP is the last thing you should be designing. You should be designing the almost like the top. The, the, oh, really? the, the, the sort of, you know, the space you're sitting in as an atmosphere and the I, IP should be secondary. It should only offer you infotainment and safety. That's it. And as a volume, you should push it down and you should push it as much forward as possible. Right. Give yourself more feeling of space. And, you know, customer preferences, obviously shaping design. Sunroof, for example, is this something which uh, you find fascinating in India that we just love sunroofs? I'm not surprised. I mean, I've always had a sunroof my entire career, if not a convertible. So, so uh, yeah, but but in India, yes, in India, it's a uh, you know something that's just you know recently you know caught on. But I think it's just normal. I think you know people don't want a claustrophobic space, and uh, you know there's ways you know okay you have the glass roof, yeah, and you think like okay I'm gonna get hot in here or I'm gonna bake. But in the end, there's ways, you know, whether it's the glass technology or just good air conditioning, climate control system and everything like that. You can you can control the environment and actually have then the benefit of having this very nice open, airy, airy environment. And, uh, you know, again, just talking on, uh, let's say, the interiors in the future, there's going to be this talk of autonomous driving or ADAS coming in more and more. Do you, do you think uh, this whole lounge like experience in the car is going to kind of accelerate where it's not just primarily driver centric but it's you know let's say passenger centric i think what you'll see is uh you'll see um, like you said the, more adas systems eventually leading to full autonomy that'll become you know the, the vehicle will become a space which you know how do you use the space what are you doing it in? um so make it as comfortable you can do other other functions and so forth so you'll have that as one train uh you know where it becomes a, a lounge or a space then at the other end, you'll have vehicles that are more engaging. Uh, you know, even if they're an EV, they have to be more, more, you know, sort of first person, you know, uh, control. And uh, and I think that's just natural that you'll see this sort of, you know, polarity. Yeah. You know, something a bit more autonomous, more of an, an you know, an A to B mobility device. And then you'll have something which will be far more engaging. You know, whether the, maybe the design is a bit more engaging, you know, exterior wise, but then also the user experience has to be more, more emotional. Right. And last question, do you see cars really changing completely in shape? Do you think you'll have mono volume or blob like vehicles or customers will want the traditional two box and three box shapes, which they're just accustomed to? Yeah, I think you'll see actually a little bit of both. I think you'll see the extreme of both. You'll have this sort of, you know, mono volume. It becomes a pod, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, it's a device to get from A to B reliably and safely. And then you'll see, you know, far more extreme niche products. You know, whether they're a two box, three box, you know, or, or you know, whatever typology they are. 
and uh, but they have to be again more engaging, more of a statement. You know, nobody wants anonymous vehicles, and nobody wants uh, you know products that are just white goods, right? And and so you think design is going to be much play a much bigger role in differentiation because honestly, the way cars are driving. They become very homogeneous, yeah. you know, kind yeah. of one-dimensional in many ways, especially EVs. The, uh, so, so do you think design is going to be a real key differentiator in, in you know, future of mobility? Oh, for sure. Uh, design has this uh, huge opportunity to, to create products that are emotional. Uh, and anybody who cracks that code will be successful. Well, Martin, uh, thanks so much for talking to us. Uh, we are back to where we started. It was a great ride and uh, wish you all the best and please continue giving us some fantastic looking products. Thank you. Thanks for the ride. And uh, I'm really looking forward to actually showing you what we got in the pipeline as we uh, as we develop these cool. Look forward. Thanks Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.